Thank you to Ted from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 2, you may notice some fashionable Nuka-Cola vending machines and pass by them thinking they were merely set pieces. Still, if you have some money in your inventory and can pass the luck or agility check, you can buy 10 to 20 bottles from each machine. These machines will restock every two to three weeks, so this gives you a steady source of the pre-war soft drink for things like super stim packs from Myron. Due to the trimetric viewpoint of Fallout 2, some people may have just assumed the caves found in the wasteland were just for decoration, and sometimes they are. Still, you can find some caves that have exit grids inside them and lead to interior cells. These caves are often packed with varying enemies and can hold some great treasure. In Fallout 2, right outside the main gates of Vault City, you can find a bartender, John Cassidy, that can be recruited as a companion. This is the father of popular New Vegas companion, Rose of Sharon Cassidy. He would meet a tribal woman after the events of Fallout 2 and conceive the foul-mouthed Caravaneer. John left the scene, and Cass grew up with his name and attributes, as well as a pendant that belonged to him. In Fallout New Vegas, we can meet Daisy Whitman and Novak. She is an old pilot that isn't too open about her past, though we can get her to open up about a crash she had over Klamath. Vertebird pilot. 71 missions and only lost one chopper. Rotor malfunction over Klamath. Hard landing, but I walked away. You can find this crash in Fallout 2, as it features Klamath. If you can make it past the robot, we can see that Daisy is lucky to be alive, as a couple of her faction mates weren't so fortunate. In the original Fallout, we find a world filled with dark humor, despair, and a ton of fun easter eggs to brighten the mood. Some can even be found before we start playing the game. From the main menu, if you were to click on credits and then type boom while they were rolling, you would be greeted with a picture of Tim Kaine, one of the co-creators of the series. After he's on screen for a second, his head will explode. Doing this with modern resolutions will have a weird effect on the video due to how it was added to the scene. This is just one of the great secrets the first Fallout game holds, and it's always awesome to find these types of things in our favorite games. The Fallout 2 guidebook has been one of my favorite books since I was a kid. I would regularly check it out from my local library to the point where I ended up just keeping it. I would eventually buy my own and it remains in near mint condition today. This book actually makes an appearance in Fallout 2. Once you've destroyed the Enclave's oil rig, if you go to New Reno and speak with Father Tully, he will gift this softcover book to you. The in-game description reads, well, this would have been good to have at the beginning of the goddamn game. I have always loved this type of thing in video games. Fourth wall breaks can be super fun and humorous when done correctly, and I think Fallout 2 nails it here. In the classic Fallout games, you will come across NPCs that have talking heads. This term refers to NPCs you interact with that have a voice dialogue and a first-person conversation box. What some fans may not know is that these heads are made from clay, after which they are edited through various programs and saved in sync with the voice lines of each character. This practical effect is another great way the Fallout devs visually made the game stand out and add certain vibes to the classic NPCs that haven't been matched since. I would love to get my hands on one of these old sculptures for my Fallout collection. What a fantastic piece. In Fallout 2, you can encounter aliens out in the wasteland during your travels. They are intense and brutal, but they are not extraterrestrial. Outside of Redding, you will only see them as aliens. Still, when exploring the underground mines of the town, you will see they have changed to their proper name, Wanamingo. Fallout 2 does this because most everyone in the game world knows these creatures as aliens, so the Chosen One would only have that as a reference, making them appear as aliens in the logs. But in the minds of Redding, people know them for what they are, so it has changed to represent that. Wanamingos were made using FEV for fighting wars against other countries. Many people familiar with Fallout 2 know the beauty of a low intelligence run. Stumbling around the wasteland with an area thought in your head can be quite an enjoyable experience, and it changes the game in many ways. This conversation with Tor, found in Klamath, is my favorite, so I wanted to showcase it in a video. If the Chosen One has an intelligence stat below 4, they will be able to communicate with Tor on his level, opening up complete sentences for both you and the humble tribal. I have always liked small details like this in the Fallout series, and many more can be found by playing the game this way, one of the many things that makes Fallout 2 stand out beautifully. If you hold shift and click on the credits in the original Fallout game, you will be treated to some spicy quotes and memes from the dev team, which I'm showing to you sped up a bit here. This would also be carried over to Fallout 2 by doing the same thing. Holding shift and clicking on the credits button, we can see some more spicy memes.
A stunning reference to the famous painting Boulevard of Broken Dreams exists in Fallout 2 as a special encounter. The Café of Broken Dreams is a copy of the Maltese Falcon from the original Fallout, but that isn't the only callback we find here. There are player models from the first Fallout that were not playable here, like the red-haired female in Black Male. Set and Tandy, who appeared in the first game, are here as well. Young Tandy, that is, as President Tandy resides at NCR and is much older by this time. And the main event of this encounter is the fact that we can find the original dog meat here. If the chosen one is in the Vault 13 jumpsuit, dog meat can join the party. In the town of Modoc in Fallout 2, you can come across Grisham and his two adult offspring, Mira and Davin. Regardless of player gender, if the chosen one sleeps with one of the NPCs through dialogue, it will lead to a cutscene of a shotgun wedding between that character and the chosen one. This can happen regardless of your party limit and is permanent unless they die in some way, save for the obvious choices as you can sell either character to slavery or request a divorce in New Reno for a bottle of liquor. Most people will be looking to do this because Mira and Davin are just about the worst companions you can get in Fallout 2. At least the pariah dog has the redeemable quality of being a dog. In the original Fallout game, you could come across an alien ship that seems to have crashed in the middle of the wasteland. You can find the alien blaster at this encounter, but you can also find an item called Fuzzy Painting. This is a portrait of music legend Elvis Presley and is modeled after an actual painting of the star. Likely, the picture can be found at an alien ship because of the various conspiracy theories that Elvis was alive. Some people even thought he could have been abducted and living with aliens. Many of these paintings can be found in Fallout 2, with the most interesting one coming from Dr. Jubilee in NCR. After helping Salt Beef Bob get a drink, the Chosen One has the opportunity to purchase a Velvet Elvis that just happens to have a map of Vault 13 on it. In the classic Fallout games, you can find special messages on the Pip-Boy on the in-game dates that host holidays. Days like Valentine's Day, April Fools, Halloween, and Christmas will prompt a celebratory greeting on the Pip-Boy 2000's main screen. Similarly, in Fallout 4, we can see that Diamond City will decorate the market based on Halloween and Christmas, adding new lights and Christmas trees for the most wonderful time of the year, and cardboard cutouts of cats and pumpkins with Happy Halloween banners for the most spookiest time of the year. I like these small details being in the Fallout world. The classic Fallout Pip-Boy messages make sense, as the computer is likely programmed to these dates pre-war. Still, it's nice to have that festive feel for these days with the Diamond City decorations, a terrific little easter egg that really adds personality to the settlement. In Fallout 2, we can find a special encounter called a Tin Woodsman. Inside this encounter, we can find an Enclave soldier who seems to have rusted armor to the point where he can't move anymore. All he can do is cry out for the oil can that is merely feet away from him. If the Chosen One picks up the oil can and uses it on the Enclave Soldier, it will lubricate the armor and open up dialogue. After expressing his gratitude, the Enclave Soldier will give the Chosen One 150 microfusion cells and then run off into the wasteland, never to be seen again. Because he probably fucking killed himself. We can find two unique map objects when it comes to this encounter as well, including the Cola Fridge and the Circular Stove. This special encounter as a whole, of course, is a reference to the Tin Woodman from the wonderful Wizard of Oz, who had a similar problem with Rust, where he would lock up and become immobile when exposed to moisture such as tears or rain. There is an unmarked quest in Fallout 2 called Become a Porn Star. In this quest, the Chosen One can approach the Golden Globes porn studio in New Reno and ask the Corsican brothers about starring in the film. Suppose your character has charisma set to at least 9, with agility and endurance at 8 or higher. In that case, you can pass the audition and become the biggest star in New Reno. Having things like the Kama Sutra Master Perk or the trait Sex Appeal will help with this. After passing the audition, the Chosen One can pick through a plethora of porn names such as Arnold Swollen Member, Jenna Jamison, or Corvega Sally. It also comes with a pretty dicey Vault Boy representation in the Pip Boy. This was considered a negative title in game, with the prize fighter being the positive opposite, though having the prize fighter title does help with getting the job. In Fallout 2, the Chosen One is tasked with finding a Gek and then rescuing the Arroyo tribe from the Enclave oil rig, blowing it sky high on the way out destroying the Enclave. The game allows you to continue to roam the wasteland after doing so, but that doesn't mean that this can last forever. In fact, Fallout 2 has a hard-coded time limit whether you complete the main quest or not. After 13 in-game years, on July 25th, 2254, Fallout 2 will abruptly stop, no matter what the player is doing, and it will show this end screen. Afterward, the player will be booted to the main menu. This was done due to coding restraints. At the time, the developers figured it was such a long time frame that no one would hit it unless they tried. 
Regardless, the Chosen One's journey must come to an end, even if it's the rarest screen in the entire game. In Fallout 2, the Chosen One leaves their tribe and stumbles through the wasteland for years looking for the Garden of Eden creation kit. While the Gek is a rare item, we can find an even more unique piece in the caves under Modok. During the quest to find the Gold Watch, we can search the outhouse to see a giant rat guarding various items, including the watch. Using something like plastic explosives, we can breach the wall and defeat the rat to claim our prizes. One of the easier to miss items down here is one of the rarest in the game, a bag. This bag can help with organizing your inventory and can hold up to 20 pounds, but it won't be able to hold any more significantly sized things like armor sets. This is the only bag that we can find in Fallout 2, so it's a must for rare item hunters and people looking to add more organization to their inventory. Let me know in the comments below what you plan to put in your bag. In Fallout 2, we can find a bunch of things when looting around and searching the environment. Still, there is one item we can get our hands on that is only found on four NPCs across the wasteland, and it is completely useless. People like Josh, the bartending undertaker in Redding, or Bill at Salvatore's Bar in New Reno, have pocket lint in their inventory. While most random miscellaneous items in the classic Fallout games can at least be sold for caps, the lint has no value. Due to its rarity, including one being on a scientist in the end game area of the oil rig, this is truly a collectible for rare item hunters who like to show off the most hard to find things in the wasteland in their highwayman's trunk. In the original Fallout, the Brotherhood of Steel would send the Vault Dweller to the West Tech Research Facility on a quest to retrieve a holodisc. This location, also known as the Glow due to the high amount of residual radiation that lingers here, holds a great throwback to Doom, a game many consider to be the father of modern day first person shooters. On different floors of the facility, we can find key cards. These cards are different colors and match the elevators located throughout the glow. The yellow card opens the yellow door, the red one opens the red door, and unsurprisingly, the blue one opens the blue door. The color of these cards and the doors that they open is a reference to Doom. In the game, you would need to find yellow, red, or blue cards to open matching doors on most levels. The setting of the glow can be compared to Doom as well, as before turning on the power, it is a dark, cramped, cursed location with robots instead of demons. Big thanks to Ted from the Discord for suggesting this one. In Fallout 2, consider heading to Broken Hills when you are looking for something to do outside the main quest and want to earn some money. This is where we can meet Bill, a caravan master, and he has a couple of jobs for the Chosen One. You can shovel Brahmin Dung for $100 or bump up to the $200 mark for a caravan protection gig. We will be paying more attention to the former in this video. If the Chosen One has an intelligence of at least four, they will be able to repeat this job, and after five times, a new special perk will show up on the character sheet. The Expert Excrement Expediter perk will grant the Chosen One plus 5% to speech at the cost of some reputation loss in Broken Hills, and more than fair trade. Small details like this really tie the worlds of the classic Fallout games together. Taking small jobs and having them affect the character directly is a nice touch. This perk in particular is a fun and humorous one to add to the collection. In Fallout 2, we can find many items that do nothing other than make us scratch our heads, leaving us to hold on to them just in case. Whether it's an out of place weapon or just some random junk, explorers have plenty to find. On the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, we can come across Dave Handy, named after a developer who worked on the game. Billy in the Den has some fun things to say about Dave, but we are looking more into what he has in his pockets today. If we pickpocket or kill Dave, we can get our hands on the one of a kind item, the Trophy of Recognition. The in-game description reads, a solid gold trophy with the inscription to Dave from DCs for being a special person. The trophy has an incredibly high value of 2,000 but also weighs 10 pounds. So whether you plan to sell it or just leave it in your car's trunk for a keepsake, rare item hunters will want to visit Dave the next time they are in San Francisco. In the original Fallout, we come to one of the most intriguing locations of the series, the Cathedral. The children of the cathedral run this location, and deep underground, they hold quite the secret. One of the most prolific villains in the Fallout universe resides in the vault here, the Master. While with most NPCs we can get some more information out of them with keywords, the Master doesn't seem interested in all that. Here is everything Richard Gray can tell us about in Fallout. So what shall it be? Do you join the Unity, or do you die here? Join. Die. Join. Die. Die. I am the master. I do not have to answer to you. I am not here to answer your questions. You are here to answer mine.
In Fallout 2, you can come across a special encounter called a Crash Shuttle, with the world map circle calling it Federation Shuttle. And, laying outside the craft, we can find a bunch of dead red shirts. Of course, this special encounter is a big reference to the Star Trek franchise, with the design of the shuttle being pretty much identical to those we see on the USS Enterprise from the original series. The red shirts that we see here are also modeled after the ones that we see in Star Trek. Of course, these are the people who have the most unfortunate luck in the entire series and always end up dying in some horrible way. This encounter also holds a reference that's more personal to the development of Fallout 2, with the name of the craft and the starship that it originated from being a reference to Adani Torres, who was an intern artist that worked on Fallout 2. We can find futuristic looking hypodermic needles on the red shirts. These, in game, can heal 75 to 100 HP, they're pretty good. The Chosen One was supposed to be able to find a phaser here at this encounter, but that was unfortunately cut. It would have acted as a high power energy pistol. In Fallout 2, the Chosen One can get a quest to rescue Smiley, the trapper, from the toxic caves. After finding him, one might notice the generator and elevator nearby. This is pretty much impossible to get into in the early game, as you need good repair or Vic as a companion to do the repairs for you and you need to be skilled at lockpicking. Well, the skill won't get you far here, as you also need an electronic lockpick, which can be found in places like San Francisco and Navarro. A prepared chosen one could manage to get through the elevator. Still, they will be met with a security bot, also known as a sentry bot, on the lower level, which will, of course, be hostile. This is not the only sentry bot in the game, but it comes out of nowhere to stop you from going any further. More of these guys can be found at the Sierra Army Depot or the oil rig, implying the Enclave likes to use them. If we manage to win this fight, the reward is arguably one of the best weapons in the game, the Bozar Rifle, which can blow away Deathclaws in one burst. In the original Fallout, one of my favorite things is meeting the various people who call the Wasteland home. The Fallout series is rife with interesting characters, and one of the best can be found right in the hub. Harold is an old FEV victim that has made a living with caravans, but due to some bad luck, has settled in the hub and is a bit down in the dumps. Speaking with him will give us some insight into his backstory, as well as some much needed humor in the post-apocalypse. One of the things that we can do in the classic Fallout games is ask different characters about various topics. Usually we will get a pretty vague default response. Still, if we ask Harold about the Master, we will get a tremendous unique line from the Resident Mutant. Oh, hey, it's you again. Who? Is he some sort of sex therapist? I could use one, you know? In Fallout 2, we are at New Reno again. The bright lights and bustling citizens of this condemned hellhole are sure to feed into any vice that the Chosen One may have. While the main bits of Reno are filled with sin, this isn't the same for every spot in the area. In fact, the Wrights have a tremendous setup to the east. This is where we can chat it up with the many Wright children who have some unique humorous dialogue if we visit them after completing the main quest. Still, if we barter with them, two of the children will have a rare object we can only find here. We can get the small figurines from the kids for just about $200 or a good pickpocket skill. The in-game description reads, You think this might be a carving of the Pip-Boy, but you can't be sure. While this model looks slightly different from what we know Vault Boy to look like, it's still a nice rare find to add to our collection. Many players may not even come this way in New Reno, and the children themselves are hard to spot, making these statues pretty easy to miss. Shout out to the Wanderer for suggesting this one, a link to his YouTube channel is in the video's description. One of the things I like most in the classic Fallout games is how the artist transcribed signs, graffiti, and posters into the game world. With an almost tilt-shift look, the trimetric point of view allows for some very charming takes on small details like these. One poster, that appears in both games, stands out due to the subject of the photo. We can find this poster in places like Junktown in the original Fallout and Modoc in Fallout 2. While it looks a little creepy to the uninitiated, this is actually a photo of Maynard James Keenan, frontman of the band Tool. The photo originally appeared in the booklet for the band's first album, Undertow, among other unsettling imagery. It's safe to say that the devs at Interplay and Black Isle were Tool fans and felt like it would be an excellent way to show their love by plastering this picture of Maynard all over their wasteland. So this begs the question, does this make Tool canon in the Fallout universe? In Fallout 2, anytime the Chosen One returns to the den, they will see this world map, which is an aerial map of real-world Phoenix, Arizona from 1885. It's here that we can choose how to enter the den, from the east or the west, but there is another option that Fallout 2 doesn't show us as it was ultimately cut from the final game. 
Pressing the number 3 on your keyboard when over this map will spawn the player in the cut Din Residential area. It holds a few houses, a bunch of generic NPCs, and even a copy of Smitty that we can't interact with. The plan was to use this area for a quest that would see Mom, from Mom's Diner, organize an orphanage in this area. The Chosen One would be tasked with clearing out a suitable building and helping the children along the way. This quest was included in Killap's Restoration Project, which adds a ton of cut content back into the game. So while this remote area in the original game is cool to visit, it's nice we have a chance to see what the final plan was with the restoration patch. In Fallout 2, we can get up to some sleazy deeds, especially when visiting New Reno. When exploring such a city, protection is a must, and I'm not just talking about some armor and a good weapon. While these will protect you from the apparent dangers, it's essential in this post-war wasteland to bundle up when getting intimate, and Fallout 2 has us covered. We can find various condoms, known as Jimmy Hats in-game, scattered around the world. Jenna in the tankers sells a ton of them, pimps on the streets of New Reno carry them, and a lot of mobsters keep them around just in case. Still, nearly all the condoms we can find are in the blue or green packaging. There is another color though, and the only two that we can find for sure are being carried by the jet master, Myron. For rare item hunters, these red jimmy hats are precisely what we are looking to add to our collection, so it would be best for Myron to hand them over. These can be used before interacting with some of the more friendly residents of New Reno, but who needs that drama when you have a collection to maintain? In Fallout 2, there are so many small things to find. Out of all the Fallout games, I think Fallout 2 has some of the most interesting small details of the series. This extends to items that seemingly have no use at all. For instance, in Golgotha, we can dig up the rare gold tooth. The item description claims that it used to belong to Jules, but it's ours now. The reason it says this is because the only other gold tooth we can find in the game is in his inventory. It wouldn't make any sense to make a duplicate of the same item, so the description is the same no matter what tooth we inspect. Jules stands near the entrance to New Reno, scamming newcomers and doing what he can to survive. Still, rare item hunters may want to cut that last goal short to collect the gold tooth hiding in his inventory. The teeth have no use in-game other than to look cool in your stash or to sell to merchants. This makes this one of the rarest, most useless items in Fallout 2. In Fallout, one of the rarest items we can find is located in Junktown, next to the Crash House. Here we can find a small dusty box of some sort, and the in-game description reads, a television dinner. You're not sure, but it's definitely not edible. You're not quite sure it ever was. Of course, we recognize this as a frozen dinner, but the Vault Dweller doesn't quite get how someone could ever eat this, and rightfully so. Much like the Cat's Paw magazine that we can find, this object's appearance is taken from a real-life counterpart, the Swanson Beef Pot Roast TV Dinner. This is the only place that we can find some dusty box of some sort in the entirety of Fallout, unlike in Fallout 2, where the item is rare, but we can grab four around the wasteland. The classic Fallout games loved poking fun at modern-day norms. The inclusion of a frozen dinner that someone 200 years later doesn't consider edible, even when it was made, is a great example of the humor the series is known for. Thank you to Goliath from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In the original Fallout, one of the characters we come across in Junktown is Gizmo. He runs a crooked casino and wants to remove the town's mayor, Killian Darkwater, from the area. Gizmo has a unique sprite model in-game. He is by far the largest human we can meet in the classic Fallout games, and he never leaves his desk, making it part of his being. If we take out Gizmo somehow, we can see how he differs even more from standard NPCs, as if we leave for an hour, we can see that Gizmo has started to decay, and returning even later, we can find bugs swarming around his desk. To my knowledge, this is the only NPC in the classic Fallout games with a decay animation, as the rest of the NPCs disappear, only leaving gear behind. Perhaps this is due to Gizmo's size, being so large that his body doesn't simply disappear so quickly, or it could just be due to the fact that he is attached to his desk, and the devs wanted to reward returning players. Whatever the case, Gizmo stands out as one of the most unique characters in the Fallout series. In Fallout 2, the Chosen One will come to many settlements and talk to all kinds of people. The game monitors your interactions and choices, adding to your karma and reputation ratings. Each location we visit has its own opinion of the Chosen One. Still, there are reputation titles we can get throughout Fallout 2 that will apply more broadly. 
one of which is triggered by taking out as many people as you can. Suppose the chosen one kills at least 25 people, with the number of characters with good karma being at least double the number of bad. In that case, we will receive the Berserker reputation. This title is supposed to reward the player by making bad or evil characters react better in dialogue. Still, because no characters are actually flagged as bad in Fallout 2, the reputation just ends up making every NPC like you a little less. The classic Fallout games have a couple of bugs like this. Still, this scenario can take a little bit of the fun out of an evil playthrough, unless you just want everyone to dislike you anyways. In Fallout 2, you can come across my favorite encounter in the entire series, the Guardian of Forever. When first arriving at the special encounter, it may just look like some ruins, but if you're to walk through the Ark, you will take a trip through space and time. On the other side, the Chosen One will find themselves inside Vault 13, but not the Vault 13 that appears in Fallout 2. This is Vault 13 from before the events of the original Fallout. You're able to explore this level of the Vault, but there's no NPCs to interact with. The Chosen One can loot a bunch of Vault 13 water flasks and even some weapons they may find in the locker. And also, don't forget about the Solar Scorcher that lies on the floor here. There's one terminal inside the mainframe of the vault that seems to be making noise, and if you interact with it, that's when the fun really starts. It seems the Chosen One pressed too many buttons or didn't exactly know what they were doing because upon messing with the computer, it breaks the water chip for Vault 13, putting into effect the events of Fallout 1, which in the log says gives you some kind of strange comfort. The core of this encounter is a reference to the city on the edge of forever, which is a Star Trek episode that saw Kirk and Spock take a similar portal named the Guardian of Forever to New York in the 1920s. In Fallout 2, you can get the special encounter the unwashed villagers hunting a spammer. Upon first observation, it may just look like a big group of people shooting at one guy in the middle of a parking lot, all while shouting some pretty unique text about unwashed vengeance. This whole encounter is just one big reference to a real-life flame war that happened in the Fallout community back in the day. This stemmed from a spammer and general ne'er-do-well named Grim Reaper who hit the forums at the time. Grim is represented here by an NPC with the same name. The rest of the NPCs that are shooting at him, they represent the real-life members of the Unwashed Village, one of, if not the oldest, Fallout community online. A Fallout community that is still online and active to this day. The developers of Fallout 2 put this special encounter in the game to show support for the members of the community as well as reference the Flame War. As if you let this fight play out, the Unwashed Villagers will destroy the spammer and then run off into the wasteland. It is possible to engage in combat and have Grimm stay alive for the entire fight. If he lives through it and nobody else does, he'll just continue wandering around spamming his combat quotes. Inside of the warehouse, we can find six impacts and a fruit located in a locker. In Fallout 2, we are faced with many tongue-in-cheek references and adult themes throughout our journey in the wasteland. One of the things the developers worked extra hard on in Fallout 2 is the sex formula, along with its various perks. This is not a joke. There is a complicated math equation to find the Chosen One's sexual prowess, which can affect a few different parts of your journey. One of the cut reputation titles for Fallout 2 was Virgin of the Wastes. This would stick to the Chosen One until their first sexual encounter. The reputation status does not stop there though, as if the Chosen One continues this behavior, we can improve our sexual dialogue with one of these perks. If the Chosen One has sex 10 times, they will receive the opposite of the Virgin of the Waste title with the Sexpert title. This will improve the dialogue around sexual situations with the player. Seeing as Fallout 2 is, at the time of this recording, the only Fallout game in which you can become a porn star, this is not really a surprise. Still, it's a nice semi-hidden reward for the more adventurous Wasteland Wanderers. Thank you to Ted from the Discord server for suggesting this one. If you'd like to talk about Fallout and want to chat with us, check out the link to the server in the description below. In Fallout 2, the Chosen One covers many miles looking for the Garden of Eden creation kit. One of the first locations we can come across is the Den, a city filled with shady people and a slaver's guild. Still, we will be looking at Rebecca Dyer regarding this easy-to-miss unique reward. Suppose the Chosen One is a female named Buffy wearing leather armor. In that case, Becky has unique dialogue, as if she knows the player. The Chosen One can play along, and eventually, we will be rewarded $1,000, 5 stim packs, a set of metal armor, an Uzi, 5 clips of ammo, a plasma grenade, and a flower. This is quite the gear for how early we can get it in-game, and it's actually a reference to a special encounter that we can find called the Unwashed Villagers, which I have covered more in depth in another video linked here in the card. The encounter pays homage to the first Fallout fan site that is still active today. 
it is always great to see developers put in a bit of fan service in their games, and the classic Fallout titles are full of fun things like this. Throughout the Fallout series, we can find many television sets. Going back to the original Fallout, these TVs are Radiation Kings. This is a trend that continues to this day with Fallout 76. We can even visit locations related to these TV sets, like in Fallout 76 with the converted munitions factory, which used to act as a Radiation King assembly plant. And in Fallout 3, where we can visit one of the storefronts for the Radiation King brand televisions. While it may seem like a clever way to name a company in a post-nuclear apocalypse setting, it does go a tad deeper than that. The name Radiation King refers to the Simpsons TV with the same name, that we see in a Season 6 episode titled Grandpa vs. Sexual Inadequacy, where we see Homer getting hit with tons of rads while sitting in front of a TV as a child. There she is, the old Radiation King. You'd park yourself right there and watch for hours on end. While this is not the only reference to The Simpsons in the Fallout series, it is for sure the most significant. The Simpsons have a special place in my heart as I grew up watching the first 10 seasons and loving them. Still, with Fallout being my favorite game series, for me, this was a match made in heaven. In Fallout 2, the Chosen One can find themselves in all kinds of different places doing all sorts of different things. From prize fighting in New Reno, to becoming a citizen in Vault City. Fallout 2 is ripe with things to see and quests to complete. There are far more nefarious reputation titles in Fallout 2 though, and one will require a shovel and a strong stomach. If the Chosen One has these things, we can find our fortune in the wastes by grave digging. Digging up a grave will result in negative 5 karma and also give the player the grave digger reputation title. This isn't the end though, as each grave we dig after this will hit the karma by another 5 points making this a perfect career for someone who wants to do a low karma playthrough. However, a few graves will not give us this reputation, most of which involve quests like Anna Winslow's grave in The Den, Coffin Willie's grave in Golgotha, and the fallout shelter that can be found in the Gangster Cemetery as well. While taking up this practice can result in getting some good gear, the people of the wasteland will start to dislike you the more you dig. Still, to some, the loot is worth it. Thank you to Ted from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 2, our quest for the Gek will lead us to Vault City, a gated authoritarian settlement outside of Vault 8 that used the Gek device once leaving their vault to form their own version of paradise. Outside, alcohol and chems are strictly prohibited inside of the city. Because of this, the taverns around town serve synthetic drinks. At the parlor room in Vault City, we can partake in some Alcohol Z, which has some amusing side effects. There is no inventory item for Alcohol Z. When purchased, the drink is consumed, but it is connected to an unmarked quest called Drink Your Weight in Alcohol Z. This requires the Chosen One to drink 100 bottles of the synthetic liquor, which will open up a fourth wall breaking dialogue option. Depending on our luck stat, the bartender will ask if the Chosen One is okay, in which we can reply, No, no, I feel great. I'm just going to pop out of dialogue for a second and check my max hit points. This is how Fallout 2 directs us to check our character sheet after doing this, with the higher luck builds getting a boost to their max HP and lower luck characters getting a debuff. This is just one of the many fun ways Fallout 2 breaks the fourth wall, and it's always nice to come across them in-game. In Fallout, one of my favorite settlements is Junktown. The way the town is built feels just right and there is a ton to do when we first show up, but I want to focus on an item that can only be found here and deep under the cathedral. In one of Gizmo's rooms, we can find this box of noodles, with the game letting us know that we have no idea what instant spaghetti is. There are only two of these boxes in the game, with this being by far the easiest to obtain. The other box of noodles is in the clutches of a super mutant guarding the cathedral. Hopefully you are not down here just for the noodles, as this item has no use in game, except of course, for being sold at vendors. This follows us to Fallout 2 as well, where the box of noodles is a bit less rare, with 5 being littered around the wasteland, they still have no use beyond selling them. The box itself is actually the real life print of the 1940s Chef Borardi spaghetti dinner, using the same graphics and shape of the box. This is interesting because we rarely see real life brands in the Fallout universe, and it's usually an oversight. This box of noodles may never become the food it was designed to be. Still, the glory of instant spaghetti can live on through your inventory centuries after it was created. Thank you to Mick the Ghoul from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 2, the Chosen One is met with the harsh, unforgiving wasteland and its people. 
one of the more deplorable towns is New Reno. While the rest of the wasteland seems to struggle and strive, Reno seems to manufacture it, almost as if the city was trying to emulate its former glory from all the wrong angles. Inside the Shark Club here, on the second floor, we can find a hidden item that can help more than you might think. In the bottom right corner of the main room, we can find a pool table, and if we search it inside, we can obtain the Magic 8-Ball, the only one of its kind in Fallout 2. Shaking the 8-Ball, much like in real life, will display fortunes and answers to various questions that you might have. With a luck stat of 9 or higher, the 8-Ball will even give us small clues about various happenings in the wasteland, such as telling us about a cat's paw magazine thrown away in Broken Hills. The 8-Ball even references some developers of Fallout 2, claiming that Fergus didn't want it to be included in the final game. The fortune teller will even bring up other interplay projects, mentioning, yes, we know Descent to Undermountain was crap. This is another great example of the humor in the classic Fallout games. They are filled to the brim with fourth wall breaking jokes and inside gags that add continuous charm to each playthrough. In the original Fallout, we can find a good amount of companions to join the Vault Dweller's quest. It's always good to have a friend in the wasteland, and when we come to Junktown, there is one waiting for us to show up. In the settlement, we can meet Phil. Phil has been stuck outside his house ever since a pretty vicious looking dog took up shop in front of his door. Unless someone lends a hand, this seems to be a stalemate. Typically, the Vault Dweller could offer dog meat and iguana on a stick. The treat seems to calm the beast, and we now have a new canine companion, one of the best followers in the game if we're being honest. This is not the only way to get dog meat on our side though, as if we have a leather jacket in our inventory and we equip it, the dog will run to the Vault Dweller and immediately become a companion. This is a direct reference to Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, where we can find that the armor in-game is identical to Max's attire in the film. This shows his connection to the dog in the movie and is an excellent callback to the Mad Max series, as our new canine friend instinctively follows Max. This creates a great visual for the rest of the game as we can wander the waste with this iconic jacket and our faithful companion. However, this version of Dogmeat was said to be killed during the Mariposa excursion, but his spirit lives on through the rest of the Fallout series. In Fallout 2, you can come across a giant stone head in the waste, along with a beautiful waterfall. This stone head represents the Vault Dweller from the original Fallout. Interacting with the stone head will prompt it to tell you to keep your damn hands off of it. After telling the head that you are the chosen one, an argument will ensue. That will last 12 hours. Ultimately, the head of the Vault Dweller will give up and accept that you are the chosen one, rewarding us with a monument chunk. The in-game description reads, This is a piece of the disgruntled stone monument you found out in the desert. Although many of your village would no doubt regard it as a sacred relic, somehow you suspect that you have been cheated. Consuming this chunk will give a plus 3 boost to strength and agility with plus 50 damage resistance as icing on the cake, but this lasts only an hour. After that time has passed, it will actually debuff the chosen one, taking 3 points from strength and agility, but this will also only last an hour. If you feel brave and have a high steal skill above 95%, you can steal 3 more of these monument chunks from the head. It won't be pretty if you fail the skill check though, as the Sacred Head of the Vault Dweller deals impossible amounts of damage and will gib you instantly. This is an incredible special encounter to come across in your travels as it adds some humor from the lore of the series and it's just as outrageous as it needs to be. Fallout 2 players have a permanent wild wasteland trait due to all the wacky stuff in this game, and I love it. This video was suggested by a user on Discord. In Fallout 2, when you find yourself in Broken Hills, make sure to pay the scientist and his rad scorpion a visit. While we are in here, we need to steal the spectacles from the scorpion. Now, we make our way to New Reno, heading over to Renesco's pharmacy on the west side of town. During a conversation with Renesco, we can give him the glasses, and there are a couple rewards for this, including a discount at his shop, but if we turn these down, it opens up the path to an incredibly rare item. What we have to do is ask Renesco 20 times about the glasses after giving them to him. Once we do, he will get frustrated with the line of questioning and thrust the Pip-Boy Medical Enhancer into our faces. The in-game description reads, The Pip-Boy Medical Enhancer consists of a storage hollow disc, microfilament cord, headgear, and an optical sensor that is placed over the user's left eye. When used, an optical flash transmits a dictionary of physician skills and know-how into the user's memory permanently improving the user's doctor skill. Due to this being an unmarked quest and the NPCs involved being so out of the way, most people who play Fallout 2 miss this item entirely. Once used, the Chosen One will proclaim, Whoa! 
the doctor is in, and the log will read, you have used the Pip-Boy medical enhancer. A vast amount of medical knowledge floods your brain. It will increase the chosen one's doctor skill by 10. In Fallout 2, one of the locations we will come across is the town of Gecko. Not only is Gecko home to everyone's favorite FEV reject, Harold, but it is also the only place we can find a decently rare item in the game. Speaking with Gordon of Gecko, we can learn just a bit about the religious group that follows the brain. If we kill or steal from Gordon, we can see a talisman in his inventory, and the item description reads, a talisman which is worn by the followers of the brain. There are three of these charms in the game, all of which can be found on ghouls inside Gecko. This item is a terrific reference to Logan's Run, where a similar necklace is featured. Before we leave Gordon, we should loot the cheesy poos from the locker. Now, we can head down the ladder to the access tunnels. Once under the city, we can make our way to the back chamber and finally come face to face with this brain. He's the brother of King Rat, whom we met under Trapper Town in Klamath. This whole encounter is pretty easy to miss. Still, if we have the cheesy poofs in our inventory, we can get unique dialogue from the brain about how much he loves the snack. Most believe the brain and his less intelligent ghoul friend, Zomac, are a reference to Pinky and the brain, as the giant rat in Fallout 2 has plans to take over the world. And you help him every time Gecko's problems get solved. In Fallout 2, there are many things that the developers were planning on including but ended up cutting from the final game for one reason or another. One of the most exciting pieces of cut content is the cut location known as the EPA. This multi-layered facility was set to hold a ton of objects and secrets that would have added some great experiences to Fallout 2. Killapse Restoration Project adds most of, if not all, the cut content back into Fallout 2, allowing us to explore the EPA and find the various items removed from the final vanilla game. One of the unique items we can see is a bag of Pop Rocks. The in-game description reads, An unopened bag of tasty carbonated candy made of sugar, lactose, more sugar, corn syrup, even more sugar, and flavoring. It is rumored that when mixed with Nuka-Cola, one's stomach would explode. This refers to the real-life urban legend that replaces Nuka-Cola with its real-life counterpart, Coca-Cola. And we can test this out in Fallout 2 to see if there's any truth to the rumor. Your life ends in the wasteland. In Fallout 2, we can find many items that will help the Chosen One with their journey, some rarer than others. One of the best things you can do in the classic Fallout games is to search every shelf, desk, and locker you see, as you never know what will be hiding, just waiting to become a part of your inventory. A lot of rare items can be found in the New Reno Mob Cemetery, Golgotha, which in itself walks the line of being a hidden location. Someone could play through all of Fallout 2 and never see the site show up on their map, as it has to be discovered through dialogue that can be missed. Once we make our way to Golgotha, searching one of the graves will turn up one of the coolest items in Fallout 2, the Mirrored Shades. The item description reads, this is a pair of fashionable and deadly looking mirrored shades. Just having them in your inventory makes you feel cool. The gravesite is one of two places we can find these sunglasses in game, the other being in the inventory of Mason, new Reno crime boss Luis Salvatore's right hand man. Putting the shades in one of your active slots will boost your charisma by one, making the glasses the only non-consumable item in the game to do so. This is not increased by stacking both of the mirrored shades when equipping them. Not only do the mirrored shades look awesome in-game, but any rare item hunter will want to add them to their inventory as a nice trophy of their time in the Fallout 2 wasteland. In the original Fallout, some of the best experiences come from the conversations that we can have with various NPCs living in the world. Showing up to a settlement and talking to all of the locals is a must in Fallout, and one of the biggest cities we can find is the Boneyard. This is the shelled out remains of Los Angeles, and to this day, it is filled with warring gangs and desperate people. The followers of the apocalypse have a library here, and in a world strangled by hardship, they act as a breath of fresh air into the wasteland. The same can't be said for a character that we can find just outside their headquarters, though. Inside a small house, we can find a bounty hunter well known throughout the area. Chris Avalon. 
This NPC is clearly named after Fallout developer Chris Avalon as they share the exact same name. While most things that we can say to Avalon just result in the conversation ending, he will become annoyed if we respond to him by saying a donut. Doing this a second time will cause Avalon to become hostile and attack the Vault Dweller. Of course, if the player has the Child Killer perk, prepare for a fight. And this can be quite the fight, as Chris is pretty tough and has great gear. Suppose we do manage to defeat the bounty hunter Avalon and his crew. In that case, we can get this great gear for ourselves, including a sweet set of combat armor. The classic Fallout games are filled with in-jokes from the developers, and that is precisely what this is. Moments like this add massive charm to the original Fallout games, and finding them is always a treat. In Fallout 2, there are plenty of places to explore and plunder, but the Chosen One still has a lot to look out for. Whether it's the people of the post-war wasteland, the various genetically twisted creatures, or just a puddle of goo, one should be careful where they trek when out in the wastes. In some areas, like the toxic caves, we can see presumably radioactive waste covering the site. Sometimes we have to walk through it to get to where we are going. Rubber boots can offer a bit of protection from this goo, still, eventually they will melt away, and Fallout 2 has a fun way of dealing with the Chosen One walking through too much toxic material. The game log will inform us that bunions have begun growing on our feet, and eventually these growths will lead to a whole new sixth toe. This will surely keep us out of any high society settlements, so getting rid of it is a great choice. Going to a clinic that has an auto dock, we can pay to have the toe removed, which will then add it to our inventory. The in-game description reads, You see your sixth toe. It is a small mutated part of yourself. For some reason, you feel a terrible sense of loss as you look at the tiny amputated toe. While some NPCs may claim that this toe can be used on Frank Horgan to instantly kill him, that is not the case, and it's just likely the devs having some fun at the player's expense. The toe will give Frank a debuff on maximum HP of negative 3 though. However, the Chosen One can consume the toe and receive a plus 2 poison level and a week long period of negative 3 max HP. Still, it is quite the souvenir to carry around on your adventures, and you wouldn't want to be separated from such a special part of you. In the original Fallout, we take the role of a Vault Dweller in Vault 13. The story starts right after we are chosen to be the one to exit the Vault for the first time and venture into the Wasteland to find a working water purification chip, as Vault 13's is defunct and they will soon be out of drinking water. The Vault Dweller learns during their travels that the Master has created an army of super mutants with the forced evolutionary virus, and these mutants are being actively created at Mariposa military base. Humans are dipped in vats of goo and transformed into the monstrosities that fill out the ranks of the Master's army. Now if this all sounds appealing to you, Fallout caters to that by allowing the Vault Dweller to head to Mariposa and talk to the Lieutenant, a boss mutant who's the project's foreman. During this conversation, the mutant leader will be very adamant about learning the location of Vault 13. FEV has superior effects on clean or non-radiated humans, and a sealed Vault Tech shelter is bound to be filled with them. With one of my favorite examples of player freedom in any game, the Vault Dweller can tell the lieutenant the location of Vault 13, ending the game and getting the bad ending in the process. This sees the Vault Dweller dipped in the vats, followed by the mutant army ransacking Vault 13. This is great for when you want to stick it to Vault 13 after playing through the game before, because as we know, the Vault Dweller isn't exactly welcomed back with open arms after their journey, so why not bring the horrors of the wasteland to them instead? As people who enjoy the Fallout games, many of you have established which characters or environments you like the most. Right now, I want to talk about the NPC I hate the most out of the whole series. I'm curious about what NPCs you can't stand as well, so tell me in the comments. In the original Fallout, you can travel to the Boneyard, home to the Blades. Inside the Blades safe house, you can meet Christine. Christine is a relatively forgettable character, but something about her always grinds my gears, and it involves a bit of unique dialogue you get from asking her if there's anything else you should know. This will prompt Christine to say a string of letters, which I thought could be a code of some sort when I played Fallout as a youngin, until I started reading it. Christine will say C D E D B D ducks, and we can reply with M R not ducks. Christine will then follow with O S M R C D E D B D wings, and we can reply with Y I B M R ducks. Reading this out loud starts to show the meaning of what is going on here, a phonetic joke. Christine is saying C the itty bitty ducks and we are replying with, them are not ducks. 
Christine then replies with, oh yes, them are, see the itty bitty wings. And then we say, why I'll be, them are ducks. She is referring to the bottles of Nuka Cola laying on the floor next to Duggan and how the sprite slightly resembles a duck. I hate this NPC because she makes me say this line of nonsense in my head every time I speak to her. The vocabulary involved, mixed with the cutesy nature of the joke itself, brings me to a rage. Of course, it's not that bad, but I still take Christine out at every opportunity I get. In Fallout 2, one of the best side quests we can engage in is become a prize fighter. This involves boxing in the jungle gym and working our way up to the championship. Of course, this is Fallout 2 we're dealing with here, so there are pop culture references aplenty here. Two of the biggest being Evan Holyfield and The Masticator. Both represent real boxers, with Evan Holyfield being a play on the real deal Evander Holyfield, and the latter being a reference to none other than Mike Tyson who had fought Holyfield in a real-life bout that had some controversial moments to say the least. The fight would go down in infamy as the fight that Tyson bit a good chunk of Holyfield's ear off. Fallout 2 pays homage to this in a fun way as if you get KO'd by the Masticator, we can sometimes find the player's ear item in the inventory. And the description reads, This is your ear. The Masticator bit it off during the fight and spit it onto your unconscious body. If you're reading this, it probably means you will be reloading soon. Of course, it is possible this item has some special value. Despite the cheeky rundown of the item, it in fact does not have any special value. Still, there is a chance that we beat the Masticator, and if the Chosen One manages to knock him out, his ear can appear in the inventory with a description reading, This is the Masticator's ear. You bit it off after pummeling him senseless. Congratulations on beating him. He is one of the toughest NPCs in the game especially when you don't have any weapons or armor. Unlike the Chosen One's ear, the Masticator's is actually worth something as it can be sold at Renesco's or down at New Reno Arms for a cool $750. Fallout and Fallout 2 hold an incredible amount of small details for people willing to look for them, and New Reno hosts enough to keep you busy for hours. There are a lot of things that were cut from Fallout 2. Whether it be from time restraints or just the developers changing their minds, Fallout 2 is a goldmine of cut content for fans of the games to discover. Luckily, thanks to Killapp, we have the Restoration Patch, which includes pretty much every piece of cut content for Fallout 2. Playing through the upgrade often feels like you are playing a new game altogether, and some of this has to do with not only the new locations, but the items we find in them as well. The EPA, or Environmental Protection Agency, is likely my favorite of the cut maps from Fallout 2. It is a massive facility filled with mystery and exploration, still it has a rare item that we can only find here at the site. We can find preserved pre-war marijuana on the surface here, and a locker inside the storage shed. This isn't the only way to find the devil's lettuce here either, as if we travel to the violet level, we can interact with Mr. Kimmy, a large computer on this floor of the facility that has the ability to make various chems, and if we have a science skill above 100%, then we can request something special. Selecting marijuana, Mr. Kimmy will say he has all the ingredients to make it, allowing the chosen one to pick up some from the machine, an actual post-nuclear dispensary. Marijuana grants plus one luck and plus two charisma while debuffing perception by one per use. This lasts for 11 days, but you will lose an additional perception point after a week. The EPA would be ultimately cut from the final version of Fallout 2 due to time restraints. The team just didn't have the time to finish the area to their liking. Thus, the unique items only found here went with it. Meaning, the Chosen One wouldn't be passing any grass to Goris anytime soon. In Fallout 2, one of the first companions you are likely to meet is Solik, an angry tribal who is now being held at the Buckners in Klamath after busting up the bar. Solik came to town to find Vic the traitor to get information on his missing sister, but when Vic wasn't around, Solik lost his temper. Doing quests for the Buckners or outright paying for the damages will allow Solik to join your party. The two of you set off into the wasteland for the adventure ahead, but no matter how long you look, you will never find Solik's sister. The quest, along with the two locations that were related to the Umbra tribe, were cut from the final game. Growing up, I always thought there would be a way to rescue the tribal sibling with the Slaver's Guild in the Den being my prime suspect. And it turns out, I wasn't so wrong after all. As with Killap's Restoration Patch, we can not only visit the tribe, but we can also complete their quests. When speaking to Metzger, if the Chosen One has speech above 51%, we can find out that the Slaver has a camp outside of town where all of the new captives are taken. If we promise him a premium price, Metzger will give us directions. Once at the camp, we can handle things peacefully or we can have some fun. There is also a way to storm the place with NCR rangers. After the smoke is cleared, we can find Karisu, 
Solik's sister, inside of a shelter in the north area of the map. Speaking with Karisu will reunite the siblings and eventually lead to the cell door being unlocked, freeing all the captured souls that have found themselves here. Once back at the Umbra tribe, Karisu makes herself at home and Solik is silently grateful. It's a shame we didn't get all this in the final game. Still, the restoration patch turns our dreams into a reality and allows us to help Solik, one of the best companions in the Fallout universe. The most likely special encounter you're going to get in Fallout 2 is a man guarding a bridge. In this encounter, the Chosen One will break the fourth wall by telling the player in floating text to save the game in a new slot, and their concern is well placed because this encounter can lead to quite a horrible death. The exit grid and the highwayman, if you have it with you, are on the other side of the bridge, and the only way you're going to get across it is if you talk to the bridge keeper. This NPC actually uses an unobtainable sprite with a brown robe, because if you are to receive the bridge keeper's robes, it will be a tone of purple, much like the children of the cathedral. The man will require you to answer the questions three in order to get across the bridge, and this is where things can go a few ways. The Chosen One can engage in combat with the Bridge Keeper, but it is a pretty hefty fight. It will reward 7,500 combat XP, and of course you'll get the Bridge Keeper's ropes, but you'll also lose a bit of karma. If you engage with the man's questions and answer them incorrectly, the Chosen One will explode into a million pieces. If you were to answer the questions three accurately, then the Bridge Keeper will walk back across the bridge, allowing you passage into the exit grid or your car. And finally, if you answered the last question with another question, like the strong back listing that is in the dialogue options, the bridge keeper will explode much like the chosen one did before with like a bloody mess incident. For those of you unfamiliar with the Fallout 2 armor system or the armors found inside the game, bridge keeper robes is some of the best armor you can get. I know it doesn't sound like it is, but it has very high resistance to things that you wouldn't expect it to. This special encounter is, of course, one of the many references to Monty Python inside Fallout 2, this one being from the Holy Grail, where an old man guarding the Bridge of Death will only allow passage if you answer his questions three. In Fallout 2, if you travel to New Reno and make your way over to New Reno Arms, you can lockpick the back door to get into Eldridge's room. His dogs want none of that action, so quickly make your way to the basement entrance behind the metal shelves. Down in the basement, we find Algernon. This is his personal hell. We aren't looking into all that in this video. Instead, we are making our way down to the bottom right corner of the map. Here, expertly hidden among unsearchable clutter, is a pot. Inside the pot, we can find an actual Easter egg. The in-game description reads, This is a hard-boiled chicken egg painted with colored dyes. This is just a silly, well-hidden item that has no use in the final game other than to act as a trophy in your inventory. Fallout 2 developer Chris Avalon stated that the egg was planned to hatch a chicken that would serve as a companion, but this idea was clearly not implemented. I must say, I do wish we could see this in-game. The most obvious reason is that it would be pretty funny to see an actual chicken travel the waste with the chosen one. Though I am curious, did Avalon mean that a legit chicken would spawn from the egg, or would it possibly be another Deathclaw companion? As we can find one in Modoc, owned by Rose, that's referred to as a chicken by the townsfolk. This is actually referenced in Fallout New Vegas where we can meet Rose's grandniece, Joss Wilkins, who will task the courier with finding a Deathclaw egg for her great-aunt Rose's original Deathclaw omelet recipe. My great-aunt Rose ran a bed and breakfast back in California, in a town called Modoc. She's the one who created the recipe in the first place. I don't know how she managed to get a hold of a female Deathclaw, but she kept it in a shed. Aunt Rose had a steady supply of eggs for her omelets. At least, she did until some stranger came along and killed the Deathclaw, shot it right in the eye. I like to think Avalon meant a real chicken because I like that visual. Either way, it would have been one more thing that made Fallout 2 such a fantastic experience. A member of my Discord server asked me to cover the cookies that appear in the Fallout series. Well, they only appear in two games, and they're one of the rarest items in the entire Fallout universe due to the scarcity, value, and how missable they are overall. In the Fallout world, these cookies have really stayed the test of time. The pre-war baked treats are still edible, and they will boost the player's action points by one for 15 minutes. In Fallout 2, three chocolate chip cookies can be found. The easiest to get is from Pharrell in Modoc. Suppose the Chosen One's intelligence is lower than four. In that case, Pharrell will reward them with a cookie after they clear his garden of rodents. Another cookie can be found here, but it will cost $1,000. Rose gives the cookies out with a glass of water, which is why the price is so high. The hardest one to obtain lies at the Sierra Army Depot. You have to complete quests in New Reno for the location to even show up on your map, and after that, you still have to find a way into the damn place. 
Once inside, down on level 2 of the facility, we can find a cookie in the break room, along with some other snacks and drinks. There was going to be a fourth location to find a cookie in Fallout 2, at the EPA map, down in the lower levels of the structure. This location and its content were cut from the final game, but they have been restored in Killapp's Restoration Project. Fallout Tactics is the only other game in the series to host this item. After reaching Bunker Gamma, the Warrior and their squad will go through St. Louis and eventually get a mission for the town of Jefferson. In Jefferson, we meet Thelma, a super mutant commander. After a confrontation, we can loot a chocolate chip cookie from her corpse. It's hard to pinpoint how cookies have avoided radiation and have remained edible after all these years, but they are for sure a fun thing to hunt and a great addition to your inventory. In Fallout, one of the most unusual items that you can find in the game is also one of the most rare. With only just a few of them littered around, one being in this shack in Junktown, the item is called You Have No Idea, and when we investigate the object, the game will tell us, upon further inspection, you still have no idea what this is. The cover says Cat's Paw, and there's a picture of a black cat on it, but that's all we have to go by during the events of Fallout. In the real world, this product is made in Canada, and the box contains anti-slip shoe covers, some cat's paws. It makes sense the Vault Dweller would not know what this is. It's only when we get to Fallout 2 that the mystery of this item in the game universe is solved, leading to one of the rarest items we can get in the game. The in-game description for the cat's paw in Fallout 2 states an issue of Cat's Paw magazine. This is the first time Fallout lets us know that in this universe, this is a publication of the adult variety. We get confirmation on this when we visit Miss Kitty, who is at the Cat's Paw in New Reno, a building that has the logo in neon on the side. Speaking with her, she will tell the Chosen One that this is an adult magazine, leading to some unique dialogue about how vague the description was in the past for the object. Miss Kitty will then ask the Chosen One to bring 10 copies for display at her place. If we have the issues of Cat's Paw with us, we can give them to her now, and we will be rewarded with the incredibly rare Cat's Paw issue number 5 which has a great article on energy weapons. Using this magazine is different than others. No time will pass, and unlike other skill books, you can increase energy weapons past 91%, which is capped for the others. This magazine will boost your skill by 10%. The cover is far more telling than the box art they used before, but I have always loved the cat logo on the original. Either way, rare item hunters will want to keep this around instead of cashing in on the experience, as it's a one-of-a-kind wasteland find. In the original Fallout, we can meet Tandy. Living in Shady Sands, she is the teenage daughter of settlement leader Eridesh and future president of the New California Republic. During the events of Fallout, she is a naive young girl who seems to find trouble anywhere she can, and we can ask her about a few things, much like we can with her father. She may not be as well-traveled as most people we meet in the Wasteland, but she still has some information to share. Hi. I heard there was a traveler in town, but I was kind of skeptical until I saw you. My name's Tandy, what's yours? That's me. Who else did you think it was? Eridesh is my father. He's okay as far as dads go. Seth's the captain of the guards. My father tried to set us up once, but he is not my type. That's where we get all our water. It's been here since before I was born. I've actually seen one, even if it was from far away. They're nasty creatures with claws and a big stinger, and their poison can be deadly if it isn't treated. You should talk to my dad, Aradesh. He knows more about them. I don't know, but the guy who told me about it was really scared of it. He said that the undead walk the streets. Junktown's a small city to the southwest. It's supposed to have pretty good trading, but my father won't even look into it. He says we need to stay protected. Yeah, right. Caged is more like it. The hub is supposed to be a great city to the south. I've always wanted to see it, but I've never got the chance. Pretty bad bunch or so I've heard. My father knows more about them. He never tells me much about the outside world. Mm, nope. I never heard of it. In the original Fallout, one of the conversation starters we can have with NPCs is the tell me about option. This allows us to use a keyword or phrase as a prompt to ask the character for more information on a particular subject. 
One of the NPCs we can do this with is Eridish, and I wanted to showcase the various things we can ask him about and what responses he gives. During most of my playthroughs of Fallout, this is a feature I have largely ignored, so it's fun to go through and see what we can learn by asking about different things. Greetings. Your business in Shady Sands might be... I am he. I lead this humble town of Shady Sands. Hmm, yes, yes, Roslo is our doctor. If it ails you, he can heal it. I would wager he is just a little north of here at this moment. A fine young man, Seth. Captain of our guards. He is likely to be at the guardhouse. She is my daughter. It is she that makes this hard life worth living. Yes, 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 it is a rumor of a monster created during the war. Hmm, no one knows for certain, but the packs seem to be coming from the northeast. Hmm, no, no, I, I have not heard of that. Mean creatures they are. Be careful of their tail. Their poison can be lethal if not looked after. Mm, yes, yes, the Khans are nastier than the Vipers, let me tell you. These barbarians attack from the southeast. Junktown is south of here. Their merchants occasionally come to trade, but not often. Be very careful with such as these. Raiders who are fanatically religious can be quite dangerous. No one here knows of their base. You will find it at the front of town. Seth will likely be there. The Vipers and Khans both use spears. We know this from their attacks. Mm -mm -mm. Very bad. There are two bands of raiders that we know of. They call themselves the Vipers and the Khans. Dharma was a great religious man. You would do well to listen closely to his sayings. In the original Fallout, we are introduced to the Brotherhood of Steel, a group of underground technophiles that harbor animosity for anyone outside of their family. One of the members we meet first is Cabot. This initiate stands guard at the door of Lost Hills and will send the Vault Dweller on a quest for lost and sacred technology, which happens to be a hollow disk inside of a radioactive crater. Cabot has quite a bit of information if we know the right things to say when using the Tell Me About option. After all, he does have a reputation for being talkative. Well, hello. What can I help you with? Well, that's me. Hmm. I don't know. You might want to ask someone more important than me. Oh, well, in the Exodus, the Brotherhood split into two groups. The group that broke away robbed the others of some of the weapons, and, and they went south. Then about ten years ago, we sent out knights to look for them, and all they found was ruins. No one knows what happened. Whoa, that's a long story. Uh, go to the library and talk to Vri. She'll be able to show you where the history CDs are. Uh, she's the head of the scribes. She's usually in the library. Go down into the basement and it's on your right-hand side. Okay, well, scribes are the keepers of all the histories and the blueprints for the weapons we make. I just love books, that's why I want to be one. A scribe, that is. The knights say he can be a tough taskmaster, but I don't know personally, because uh, I'm studying under Vri to become a scribe. Well, you see, they're the ones who want to become protectors of the Brotherhood. There's not many of them, but they train their whole lives to become paladins. You're making fun of me, aren't you? Goodbye. The ancient Brotherhood came from someplace far up north a long, long time ago. We call this the Great Exodus. 
You can read about it more if you ask free in the library. That's the town to the south, right? We get the merchants here all the time, but I, I've never been there myself. Gee, I wouldn't know what to do in a big city like that. Well, they make all the decisions around here, from what we eat to what our duties are. And uh, they argue a lot, too. The High Elder seems to have to step in a lot. General Maxon used to be Master Knight. I don't think he likes being High Elder much. You should talk to Vree, I think. She, she can uh, tell you about him. Uh, I, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. You might want to ask someone more important than me. Hmm. I don't know. You might want to ask someone more important than me. In the original Fallout, we can roam the Hub, a giant city filled with shops and memorable characters. One of the most iconic locations is the Maltese Falcon, and it's home to one of the most nefarious NPCs in the Fallout series, Decker. The notorious crime boss dwells under the bar, handing out jobs to potential gangsters in the making. We can ask him quite a few things to get some more information using the Tell Me About option, and here's what he has to say. I'm very proud of you. You're ruthless, an attribute I admire. Cain will give you your payment. I hope you're available in the future. That's not important. Just out the door into the north. You can't miss it. She's in charge of the weapon store. Amusing. He considers himself the leader of the Fargo traders. More of a figurehead, actually. He knows better than to interfere with my business. Something is making the Fargo Trader's caravans disappear. I'd like to know the cause, since it does disrupt a piece of my business. An annoying organization. Soon they may need a demonstration in the management of power. They used to control the hospital until the children took over. Now they sit and brood in their warehouse, very strange. You will find them at the northwest end of the merchant market. He's the head of the water merchants. Myths and legends. The Death Claw is supposedly a ghost or something. You have no need to know anything else about me. He's the head of the Crimson Caravan. Harold's been around for some time. He's over in Old Town. A good source for certain types of information. Most merchants live there. Simply go west from here. She's presently the head of the children of the cathedral in the hub. I've reason to believe that may change soon. He's the head of the police. Nice guy if you like the straight arrow honest type. Not like his father. Now there was a loyal man. My mother, finest woman I've ever known, gave me the idea for this the finest entertainment establishment in all the hub. It's in the center of town. One of the fabrications of the children. He's supposedly some minor deity or something. They control the water. Go to the south end of the merchant market. You'll find them there. Morpheus is the head of the children of the cathedral. He resides down in the Boneyard. Old Town takes up the entire east side. The Skags live there. They steal from the merchants and give to the poor or some such nonsense. They are inconsequential to me. That old mutant Harold would know more. In Fallout New Vegas, keeping to himself in a cave near Camp Golf, we can meet Cannibal Johnson. While stoically waiting for death to claim him, he seems to think back to his past a lot. Johnson was stationed at Navarro during the events of Fallout 2 and has bittersweet memories of the company drill sergeant, Ark Dornan. We can hear him think back about a blistering rant Sarge gave the Chosen One while at Navarro. There's a twitch in my trigger finger. I've lost my eagle eyes and the other day I could have sworn I heard Sergeant Dornan chewing me out. I'm old and I'm starting to feel it. It's not pleasant, especially when you know your mind's slipping away. And we all gotta go sometime. 
But I was hoping for something a little more heroic. He was a drill instructor I knew. He was also the meanest bastard I've ever known. Once he caught this private out of uniform, and old Dornan went off on the most ear-blistering rant known to man. It was inspiring. This leads to one of my favorite interactions in Fallout 2, and judging by this poll, more than a few of you may not have seen it. Dornan has a few lines in Fallout 2. First, he can order the Chosen One to guard duty. Welcome to Camp Navarro. So you're the replacement. What's your name, Private? What was that? Did you forget something, maggot? I am not his sir! I work for a living, you moron! You will call me Sergeant, or Sergeant Dornan! Do you understand me? Outstanding. Proceed on the double to the hangar, where you will stand guard duty! You will do a fine job! Do you understand? You moron! You are not to question my orders! When I say jump, you jump! When I say fight, you fight! When I tell you to die for your country, then you will certainly die! Have I made myself clear? He can also spot the Chosen One as a civilian and remove them from the base. If he sees us again, Dornan will assume that we are a spy and alert the base. Welcome to Camp Navarro. A civilian? How in the hell did a civilian get on this base? I'll have someone to ask for dinner! Get the civilian off government property! Well, I'll be damned. I had the bunch of you escorted off this base and here you are again. I don't think you're civilians after all. More than likely, you're spies. Sound the alarm and execute these maggots. Still, the interaction that Johnson is referring to is by far my favorite. First, we can convince Sarge that we just weren't issued any power armor, which will cause him to send us to get some from supply. Welcome to Camp Navarro. So you're the new replacement. You are out of uniform, soldier. Where is your power armor? Those paper-shuffling jackasses, how the hell do they expect me to run this unit if they keep shortchanging me on supplies? Double-time it over to the armory and get your issue, then report back to me! There's best! Soldier, you are still out of uniform. I gave you a direct order to report to supplies and get your issue! Now get out of my face and don't come back until you look like a soldier! If the Chosen One fails this attempt, the blistering rant that Cannibal Johnson was talking about comes out in full effect. Don't have any? You expect me to believe that, maggot? The truth is, you lost an expensive piece of army issue equipment. That suit is going to come out of your pay, and you will remain in this man's army until you are 510 years old, which is the number of years it will take for you to pay for a Mark II powered combat armor you have lost. Report to the armory and have a new suit issued to you, then report back to me, Private! Dismissed! In the original Fallout, when we come to the hub, we can meet a variety of interesting people. When skulking around town, we can discover that some caravans have been attacked, and even some have gone missing. If we stop by Fargo Traders, we can speak with Butch, who can not only give us a quest to solve the mystery of the missing caravans, but he also has an incredible amount of things we can ask him about to get some more information. Here is everything we can have Butch tell us about in Fallout. Leave me alone. You got your reward. Now get out! Never heard of it. You must have made it up or something. Well, it's the place where everyone goes to trade in the boneyard. It's the only place civilized enough to do it. Well, you... Uh, you don't want to go there. The prices are really high and the quality's bad. Uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, we don't talk about that. Don't you know where your own feet are? Well, it's a big ruined city to the south. The children, the followers, and Aditum are there, along with all the gangs and stuff. What do you want with them wackos? Jeez, all that peace preaching and tree hugging makes me sick. Uh, Beth's the manager of the weapon store. She hears lots of rumors, if you're into that kind of stuff. 
Heard south of the merchant market, the only source of water here and for a lot of the surrounding area. The water merchants own the damn thing. What a pain they are. We think they're hideouts in Old Town, but we can't prove it. Now there's some good eating. Bob's has got the best charred iguana this side of the desert. Now they're a bunch of gun freaks up to the northwest. Really weird. They do make a damn fine weapon, though. That's me. You blind or something? Three of my caravans have disappeared in the past month. At first I thought it was either the water merchants or the Crimson Caravan. But they've had disappearances too. Rutger's my assistant. Well, they run a big old hospital on the southwest side of downtown. Bunch of religious nuts, if you ask me. Uh, no, I, I don't... Go talk to Beth. She knows more about that crap. I, uh... Don't think I want to tell you. Yeah, that's it. Three of my caravans have disappeared in the past month. At first I thought it was either the water merchants or the Crimson Caravan. But they've had disappearances too. He heads the water merchants. Nasty, greedy bastard is what he is. He's the mayor of Junktown. That's all I know. Now you can find them over on the northwest edge of downtown. They controlled the hospital before the children moved in. Talk about trading the strange for the weird. He's the owner of the Maltese Falcon over on the west side. I'd stay clear of him. He's not honest like me. He's the boss of the Crimson Caravan. If you ask me, he's nuts. He leads the Brotherhood. It's about all I know. The Maltese Falcon is a nightclub on the west side. Hope sings there. What a doll. The Glow. It's a radioactive pit. Way, way down south. Too much radiation for anyone to live there. Oh, he's the sheriff. But if you see a crime, report to me. Justin doesn't roll the roost around here. The old town's over on the east side. The skags hang out there. He heads up the children of the cathedral, down in the boneyard. Best prices on the best guns in town. Everyone says so. It's not just that I own it. Just try out this door and make a right. You can't miss it. Old Harold? What do you want with that old mutant? He's in Old Town. Just ask there. That's over on the west side. Jane's the high priestess of the children of the cathedral and set up the hospital here in the hub. Last I heard, he's the mayor of Aditum. Junktown. Yeah, I've been up north to that place a few times. Got some great booze. It's where everybody trades. Smack dab middle of town. Those bastards. Darren Hightower thinks he owns the damn hub just because of the water tower. I, uh, <clears throat> heard stories, that's all. No truth to them. Get fucked.